Welcome to Living Hope. In today's message, Spiritual Blessings, Dr. McLuhan teaches from Ephesians chapter 1 on the blessings that all followers of Jesus receive. Ephesians is one of the most important letters the Apostle Paul wrote while he was under house arrest in Rome. <clears throat> chapter 1 expands our minds to learn more about the nature of God. People write to me quite regularly telling me, that followers of Jesus worship three gods. I know folks who write like that don't really understand the nature of God. And I love to say we worship a God who's greater than any human mind can comprehend or grasp. Followers of Jesus worship one God, but without violating his oneness, God is greater than one at the same time. This is the mystery that Jesus came to the earth to reveal to us. Now, whenever we think about anyone we know, we don't think of them in a single dimension. If I picture a friend, I think about their physical appearance, the sound of their voice and their character. So many things come to mind. A human being is a very complex being. And our Father who created us is more complex than we are. We should expect that he is greater than us. This is because we are made in the image of God. He is our creator. In chapter 1, Paul reveals the greater dimensions to who God is. But chapter 1 reveals much more than just the nature of God. Ephesians offers us an identity statement about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. The context of this powerful letter or the content of this powerful letter can be divided into three sections. The blessing of the believer in chapters 1 through 3, the behavior of the believer in chapters 4 and 5, and the battles the believer faces, the things that you and I struggle with in chapter 6. Now, after identifying himself as the writer of this letter, uh, Paul greets his followers, Jesus and Ephesus, very, very warmly. He loved that congregation so much. He spent two years there. Extraordinary miracles, we read in Acts, flowed out of the hands of the apostles and others as the word of Jesus spread through the entire region. And so after greeting the church, he launches this amazing teaching about the nature of God and our identity as his followers. This is what Paul wants us to understand about who we are and what we receive when we become a follower of his I love Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Let's look at it together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. If you hadn't memorized that verse, I encourage you to do it. The blessings of God are so immense and immeasurable. I may not feel my blessing, but it doesn't mean I'm not blessed. (laughs) I may not see my blessing, but it doesn't mean... I'm not blessed. I may not taste my blessing, but it doesn't mean I'm not blessed. I not, may not be able to touch my blessing, but it doesn't mean I'm not blessed. So let's read this powerful identity statement again. This is who you are. I'm one who is blessed. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. What a great word. Our supplier and our supply is in heaven. And all blessings come from heaven. The problems come from the other place. Physical blessings flow out of our spiritual blessings. And spiritual blessings and physical blessings in God's mind are all the same thing. When he blesses you, whether it's physical, emotional, any, it's all spiritual. It's heaven spilling over into your life and mine. The blessings of chapter 1 themselves can be divided into three categories. So the blessings of God the Father, the blessings of God the Son, and the blessings of God the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look at what you and I have. This is our inheritance. This is what we receive as followers of Jesus. So the blessings of God the Father begin this way. He identifies three specific blessings in each of these categories. First of all, he chose us to be holy. What a statement. You were chosen 
to be holy. In fact, you're already holy. You just may not realize it. We are so caught up with what the devil talks to us. But from God's standpoint of view, you're already completely holy, completely forgiven. He predestined us in love. We'll talk a minute about this complicated word, predestined. And he accepted us in the beloved. And, oh, what a joy it is to be accepted. The beloved, of course, is a reference to Jesus. He chose us. Listen to verse 4. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. <laughs> what a tremendous statement that is. Before you were conceived, God chose you. Before you did right or wrong, God chose you. Don't let anyone try to tell you you can't have a relationship with God. He's been thinking about you for eternity past. <laughs> you don't think he's not going to let you have a relationship with him right now since he thought about you before he physically made this earth. He knew everybody who would live upon this earth, and he chose. He's been thinking about you. He chose you and me to overcome the sin of this world and live a pure and a holy life. What a great God he is. Next, we learn that. God predestined us in love. What an incredible word this is. Let me just say something about it. Whatever God does is in love, but verse 5 says, in love. So whatever else you don't understand about being predestinated, it begins out of the love of God, and he knew something about you you didn't know about yourself. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Man, you can only make up, you can't just make up a sentence like that. You got to have the spirit of God upon you. And Paul's writing stuff down, flowing out of his hands. He says, God, did you mean to say that? <laughs> God, I don't get all that. Well, I don't get all that either. But, but by the Holy Spirit, Paul began to write these profoundly deep truths that he wants for us to embrace. I know that if I'd been left on my own, I never would have had sense enough to choose God. I'm so glad God chose me. And God's purpose in choosing us was to be what? Adopted into his family. Some religions are against adoption. I'm telling you, God's not against adoption. All He'll adopt anybody to be his son or his daughter. Anybody you want in, you can get in right now because God, even before you thought about him, he was thinking about you. Now, you might have had problems with your earthly family, but I'm telling you, you're not going to have problems with God's family. When we adopted into the family of God, oh, bless, bless the Lord. I'm so grateful for sons and daughters, this congregation around the world who are in the family of God. I'm not talking about joining a particular church. I'm talking about being adopted into the family of God. What a blessing it is. So we read in Romans chapter 2 that it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance. It's the kindness of God. And so he chose because he was kind. He didn't exclude, but he chose. And if you're not sure that you're chosen, I assure you you are. Ask him and you'll find out. Receive him and you'll find out. He, it is his will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance and and even though you've walked away and gone in another direction, it doesn't mean you're disqualified from God because he saw beyond that when he looked at you and before you ever were born, and he chose you. If you're alive and breathing, I assure you, the choice of God is available to you, and we release it to you. If I, God hadn't chosen me, I'll say it again, I would not have been smart enough to choose him. I'm so glad he drew me to himself by the Spirit of God. Next, we learn that God accepted us in the beloved. What a statement. Let's read it. To the praise of the glory of his grace in which he made us accepted in the beloved. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6. I remember as a young man reading Ephesians chapter 1 and saying, man, I just can't get that. That's all over me. And if you're feeling that way as you're listening today, you're not alone. Uh, just keep reading Ephesians chapter 1. Read it and read it and read it. I mean, read it for 10 years. Read it for the next five years. And God will start to make some of these truths come alive to you. The beloved is a reference to Jesus. And our acceptance before God is because Jesus has accepted us. And religions have a way of excluding people. Have you noticed that? 
you don't fit this profile, you don't match it, you know, and they just have all sorts of rules that say why you're not qualified. Followers of Jesus are accepted by God because of what Jesus did for us. You're not excluded no matter where you come from, what you've done in the past. God is interested in where you're going, not where you've come from. And we are not accepted because of our own merit, our own good deeds, our own worthiness, but because he is worthy. Jesus was worthy for us. Salvation is a gift. When we give gifts to our children at the end of the day, if we, they say to us, well, how much do I owe you for all of this, Dad? We're just heartbroken because they've missed our heart. And when you try to say to God, have I been good enough? I'm good enough to come to heaven. People have actually written that to me. It's such a shocking statement. You don't have to be good enough because Jesus was good. It's a gift. So receive the gift. We are chosen in the beloved. We're accepted in the beloved. The beloved, I've said it already, is a reference to Jesus. And so what we learn about God is that the blessing comes to us from his son. Now, here's some more blessings that come from the Son. Uh, we have redemption. What a beautiful thing. We have redemption. I'll talk with you a little bit about that word. We have revelation. That is, we have understanding from God. The Holy Spirit gives us understanding. And we have all the resources of heaven to help us. Let's, let's see what uh, Paul wrote about uh, in him. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and in all insight. What a great statement this is. In him we have redemption. And to redeem something means to go and give some money and purchase it. That, that's how the word, what the word actually redeem comes from. It's actually a market term. And people would go into the marketplace, and in Ephesians and Ephesus, there were two great markets. Uh, there was a local market and then a commercial market or the state market. And uh, Paul made tents and sold tents in that market. And so he used all this language out of the uh, marketplace to help people understand what Jesus has done for them. The first word Paul uses is agorazo, agora or agora is the market, and agorazo is to be bought in the market and taken out of the market. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, Paul wrote, you're bought with a price, bought with a price. And what was the price? It was the blood of Jesus. Another word that we find that Paul uses is the word ex agorazo, ex agorazo, to be bought and taken out of the market. He didn't buy you to wholesale you. He bought you to keep you. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Aren't you so glad? We hear this powerful teaching on what Jesus has done for us. All in Ephesians chapter 1. And all out of those marketplace language the people in Ephesus were very, very, very familiar with. But there's another word that's even more precious. It's the word lutro. And it means to be liberated by means of a payment. And Peter writes about this so powerfully. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. You're not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. What a beautiful yeah. statement. Oh, thank you, Lord. You've been bought in the market of sin. You've been taken out of the market of sin. You're not going to be wholesaled. And God brought you as a trophy Somebody special to him, through him, his, through whom his glory and his power and his love will flow. What, what an amazing God we have and, and the blessings that come to us from God the Father, God the Son. So next we learn about Jesus, that we have revelation. And this is so powerful. Look at me with verse 9 and 10. Jesus made known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things under the earth. There's a revelation. Jesus came to reveal the great mysteries of God. He is the revealer of what was hidden in the past and now has become plain. 
Now, we'll learn more about these hidden mysteries in Ephesians chapter 3 when we get there, that uh, these mysteries were hidden, as the Bible says, in Christ. And when he revealed himself, when he was revealed from heaven, the mysteries began to unfold. If you love a mystery, you'll love Ephesians. And if you have curiosity about God, you'll love Jesus because he's the mystery revealer of the great mysteries of God. Next, the blessing that follows uh, the followers of Jesus is the untold resources that are available to you and to me. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to his will. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11. And these great, isn't this a great verse? You have an inheritance. My mom and dad uh, left me a spiritual inheritance. The greatest inheritance you can leave your children is a spiritual inheritance. You know, some children, the greatest, the fastest money that's ever spent is inheritance money because people hadn't worked for it to understand it, just wasted on frivolous things. But the greatest inheritance that we can leave for our children is a spiritual inheritance. All followers of Jesus await a spiritual inheritance greater than one could ever imagine here on earth. I am an heir. Say it with me. I am an heir. I am an heir to the king of kings, the Lord of lords. You're, you're in the will. The richest man the world has ever known. <laughs> he owns it all. His blessings are so deep. And then Paul introduces us to the blessings of the Holy Spirit. So we've had the blessings of God the Father, the blessings of God the Son, and the blessings now of God the Holy Spirit. And he speaks, he saves, and he seals. He speaks, he saves, and he seals. It is the Spirit of God who opens our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and our hearts to respond to the message of Jesus. You think back about when you first became a follower of Jesus. All of a sudden, you saw something you'd never seen before. You understood something you'd never understood before. You felt something you had never felt before, and that was the Spirit of God taking the blinders off of your eyes as you're listening today to this message, especially in our audience overseas. We lift any blinder that's been on your eyes to see who Jesus is by the Holy Spirit, come and reveal yourself to genuine, to men and women whose hearts are genuinely seeking after you. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful statement this is. The moment you become a follower of Jesus, the Spirit of God takes up residence within you. You say, Father, forgive me, and Holy Spirit says, let me in, <laughs> and Holy Spirit comes into you. You may not have been aware of what happened to you at that very moment. It's a transaction God prepared for you, coming ready or not. <laughs> he came in to fill you with his presence. Now, Paul says there's much more to learn about the Holy Spirit than our simple encounter when we became convinced of our sin and our need for a Savior. It's the Holy Spirit who did that. That's not the end. That's only the beginning. And he will command us to be filled with the Holy Spirit at all times. Ephesians chapter 5 will talk about the Holy Spirit coming to live and dwell within us. But the chapter 1, he's talking what happens the moment you receive Jesus as your Savior. Don't let anybody tell you you don't have the Holy Spirit. You might not have had all the experiences other people have had in the Holy Spirit. You might be envious of the experience that other people have had in the Holy Spirit. That was certainly my case. I was very envious. And I just didn't quite know how to position myself to receive all that God had for me. But it finally happened that I received more and more of the Holy Spirit. And I haven't received all that I hope there is to receive Come, Holy Spirit, fill us, overflow us. He is the guarantee of our inheritance until we, uh, until we acquire possession of it to the praise and glory of God. So the Holy Spirit's the down payment. The Holy Spirit is down payment from heaven that more is coming. Listen, when you purchase something and put a down payment on it, it's that you're guaranteeing that more is coming. 
And listen, you might have defaulted on a loan, but God's never defaulted on his promises. There's more Holy Spirit than you could ever imagine is coming your way. It's the blessing of the Holy Spirit. So every one of the followers of Jesus has Holy Spirit living in them. The question is not, do you have the Spirit? Here's the question, how much of you does the Spirit have? And many believers are trying to get by on the initial deposit of Holy Spirit. Their life's running dry, their testimony's dry. You can tell somebody who's not really flowing in the Spirit, the stories are old. But when the Spirit comes upon you, there are fresh stories to tell about the Spirit of God working in our lives. God wants you to have more than the initial deposit. He wants you to overflow. Here's a sentence that helped me. The Spirit is in you for you, but he's upon you for others. And I release upon you. Jesus received the Holy Spirit after he was in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he was baptized. He didn't need the Holy Spirit because he lacked the Holy Spirit, but it came upon him. And may you have an upon you experience of the Holy Spirit that flows through into the lives of others. Uncork the Holy Spirit and let him out. That's what he wants to flow through your life and mine every day. Well, Paul closed this chapter with some, a glorious prayer. I do not cease to give thanks, God, to God for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him and having eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know the hope with which he has called you and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance amongst the saints and what is the immeasurable greatness of the power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. I don't know about you, but when I hear that story, I just get so stirred up when I read those verses. Something inside of me just stirs, and we, I pray that the glorious might of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Uh, young lady, Pastor Sheena, came on, on, uh, on Friday night and came up and said, Pastor, I've got something going on in my right arm. I fell, and uh, her bicep was just hurting her, and we prayed, and the Spirit of God came upon her. I said, try to do something you can't do. She put her arms right back. Eyes got as big as a saucer. I said, more, Lord. She said, I hadn't been able to do that. She was instantly healed. The power of God came upon her. She fell right down right here. Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, the fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul ends this chapter by speaking about the power that raised Jesus from the dead. God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but in the age to come get in with Jesus get in with Jesus be forgiven by the blood of Jesus you have an unspiritual inheritance and you'll be with him in heaven he's right there next to the seated right next to the throne of God ready to welcome you and me and for his power to flow through our lives. Receive Jesus as your Savior on this Coptic Orthodox Resurrection Sunday. Uh, receive Jesus today because of who he is and what he wants to do for you. May the Holy Spirit fill you with joy and with power as you serve him this week. God has touched you in this message. Write to me and tell me what God has done for you. Jesus, thank you for purchasing a new life for us. Thank you for walking, helping us walk in the blessings that you've given us. Use us, fill us with the Holy Spirit, and work through our lives so that we overflow and bring that blessing to others. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk with someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as $1 a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations to Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.